This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 411 was produced on January 18th, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. Jeroen Blokland returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss inflation, soft versus hard landing, sustainability of the U.S. national debt, geopolitics, precious metals, and much more. I want to thank the several listeners who pledged to subscribe to a paid version of my new Substack blog at erictownsend.substack.com. To let the truth be told, I didn't even know that Substack had a feature to solicit subscribers to pledge to pay for content that, uh, frankly, I'm planning to keep free anyway. So I figured out how to disable that feature so nobody else will be solicited. But for those of you who were kind enough to offer to pay for something I don't really intend to sell, uh, I'm very much flattered by the gesture. So thank you very much. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, January 17th, 2024, the S&P 500 March futures were down 102 basis points to 4771, trading in a range typical gamma pin price action for an OPEX week. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch with Nick in the post-game segment. The US dollar index up 100 basis points to 103.37, making a surprise reversal of the Powell pivot weakness. The February WTI crude oil contract up 167 basis points trading at 7256 we'll take a look at that chart in the post game the february r bob gasoline up 290 basis points trading at 213 the february gold contract down 104 basis points trading at 2006 weakening over the past several weeks but still holding above the 2000 level copper down 132 basis points trading at 373 and uranium up 1280 basis points to 1 575 making a parabolic breakout the u.s 10-year treasury yield up seven basis points trading at 410 and the key news to watch this week is the university of michigan consumer sentiment numbers and next week in addition to the earnings releases we have the bank of japan bank of canada and ecb policy statements the pce price index and the flash manufacturing and services pmis this week's feature interview guest is Jeroen Blockland. Eric, why did we get Jeroen back on the show as a guest this week? Patrick, Jeroen nailed the inflation call last time we had him on the show. So I figured since uh, everybody's asking whether or not it's really over and whether or not the uh, QT program is over and whether and when the cutting is about to begin, it seemed like a good time to get him back on. He's also based in Europe, and we like to balance the many American guests that we have with voices from elsewhere around the world. Well, Eric's interview with Jeroen Blockland is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Jeroen Blokland. Jeroen, last time we had you on the show, more than a year ago, you correctly anticipated that there was more inflation to come. Of course, uh, you were right about that. Now it seems like everybody's convinced inflation has peaked. And uh, boy, that we've gotten to the point where there's now just widespread expectations that the Fed completely reversing its policy to a campaign of cutting interest rates is just around the corner with rate cut odds in March, just blowing through the roof all the way up to 80% expectations now. So let's start with, first of all, good call. Is the inflation really over at this point, or are we just looking at a, a lull in the storm? And where are we headed with respect to inflation? I think that the uh, deflationary, disinflationary, however you want to call it, pressures are pretty significant. Um, I also expect that in the end, the US economy will slow down. Eh? So it has been much, much stronger than we all have expected. But I, I think that uh, yeah, this year, uh, yeah, the growth levels will be uh, significantly below what we have seen uh, last year. And so, so I think that uh, this inflation story is set to continue. And only, let's say, 
supply chain bottlenecks. Uh, we now have the Middle East um, or oil prices or things like that may be able to push that up again. I also expect the US labor market to slow, to, to be less strong. And that also means less wage growth. So yes, I, th- I think that inflation dropping to near or at the Federal Reserve target yeah, is pretty okay to expect. Maybe not in the first part of this year, but towards the end of, of, of the year or early next year. So so yeah, my idea is that inflation will remain relatively benign from here. The other big argument in the macro community is soft landing, hard landing, or no landing. What's your take? Yeah, my idea is soft landing to hard landing. Um, um, I, I cannot imagine that the uh, U.S. economy will continue to grow like this. It's, it's really uh, interesting to see that spiking interest rates have hardly caused any damage, uh, ex- for example, among consumer spending. So that's one thing. Uh, but I think if you look at base effects, if you look at uh, how indebted credit card debts and things like that are, yeah, so, so my idea is that we could get away with a soft landing. The reason why I'm not ruling out a hard landing is that even though, of course, the sample size of the uh, yield curve inverting is relatively small, but I have no reason to think that it does not point to a significant or severe slowdown of the US economy. And most of the time that has resulted in a recession. The same thing is true for uh, massive tightening cycles of the Federal Reserve uh, that also most of the time, there's one exception, um, has uh, resulted into a recession. And so even though things look pretty okay now, I do not agree with markets pricing out a hard landing completely. I think that is going too far. There is still a chance that we get a hard landing. No landing, um, I think, is a very small chance that will happen. I want to come back to the possibility of hard landing, because although I think the fundamentals are there for that, there's a view that's gaining a lot of popularity, which is, look, in an election year, the Fed, which is a lot more political than it admits to being, is just not going to let that happen. They're going to ease as much as they need to to prevent the hard landing, even if they risk inflation starting to run away again. Um, First of all, is that a realistic view to have? And is there a risk of inflation running away as a result of that kind of policy? Yes and yes. Uh, so I agree with the political uh, views of the Federal Reserve, even though they won't say uh, it is the case, of course. And also, if you look at, they now price three uh, rate cuts and the market is at roughly six. But I think it could well be eight if necessary. Yeah, we are now at 5.5%. So even if you cut rates by 25 basis points eight times, you are still at 3.5%. If you look at the average since the great financial crisis, that's actually pretty high. Yeah, so so I think the, the Federal Reserve will have no problem to cut rates much more than markets expect in it and, and also what they expect themselves if necessary. Uh, also, I think if you read through the press conferences of, of Powell, he is extremely keen on uh, realizing that soft landing because it would put him in another category than other central bank uh, chairman before that uh, who had to uh, face a recession in the end. So I think they are very open to cutting rates. And of course, if it gets a hard landing, I think there will be much, uh, many more uh, rate cuts and even even more um, QE perhaps, uh, even though they will try to uh, postpone that as long as possible, given that they were so wrong on, with the inflation uh, peak. And then on inflation, yes, I think if we get a s- same kind of dynamic with growing budget deficits, uh, fiscal stimulus, and quickly lower um, uh, interest rates and a s- still pretty remarkable and, and big uh, Fed balance sheet, then the odds of inflation running high again, or at least a year later or so uh, spiking again, yeah, they will increase uh, significantly. So yes, I think yes and yes are both uh, possible in this uh, election year. Now, the official story for public consumption is that the reason that the Fed is about to begin some kind of easing cycle is because they've succeeded in their goal of you know, taming inflation, and uh, it's okay to reduce interest rates. But there's a popularly growing consensus, which is, no, that's not the real reason. What's really going on is that they're concerned about the federal government's ability to fund itself, that there is uh, so much debt rollover that's coming up that they won't be able to afford to roll that debt over at current interest rates. And they're basically forced to cut rates, whether they think it's a smart idea or not. Uh, Is there any credibility to that view? 
I think that's extremely credible. Huh? So even though no major central bank uh, has an official target of uh, debt sustainability, to call it like that, I think it's it's a very clear, let's say, second-hand goal that they have. And if you look at the ECB uh, for a minute, there it's even more obvious. Huh? Without the ECB, Italy would have been nowhere. Huh? It needs continuous support from the ECB to keep its debt sustainable. Now, in the US, you see the same thing. And, and of course, the trigger behind that is these uh, spiking interest rates. If you look at how much of the total budget the US government has to pay uh, for its interest expenses. If you also add to that uh, things like healthcare and also defense, which is also becoming a, an a increasingly important topic. Uh, if you also look at the um, expectations of the Congressional Budget Office, there will be massive budget deficits for years unless there is structural austerity. I don't expect that in a very polarized political landscape. So yes, I think the Federal Reserve is very aware, aware that if they keep interest rates uh, higher for longer, they will yeah, cause massive issues with debt sustainability and interest payments of the US uh, government. So I'm, yeah, for me, it's very clear uh, to put it like this, that this is something that the Fed literally takes into account when making monetary decisions. Let's talk a little bit more about the federal debt in the United States and where it could be headed, because something I find fascinating is so many people predicted back when we had zero interest rates, they looked, they said, someday we're going to get back to 5% interest rates. And when we do, watch out, because what's going to happen is we're going to have such a rapid accumulation of the federal deficit that we're going to be adding to the national debt at the rate of a trillion dollars per calendar quarter. And that's going to cause the, the whole, you know, Know, sky to come crashing down. Your own the crazy thing is most of that story already happened. We really did get the trillion dollars in three months of additional national debt. The sky not only didn't come crashing down, but it didn't even make the news. Uh, what's going on here, and how long or how much more debt accumulation can we tolerate before something actually breaks? In my view, it did break the news. I, at least I'm very much focused on it. Uh, but if you as a economy realized wouldn't you agree that it was it was underreported in the financial press i mean it wasn't that big of a deal in most people's minds that we are no maybe i'm too spending too, too much time on uh, x or twitter twitter because there uh, you see every day there was some kind of graph showing the the debt accumulation in the united states and the 1 trillion uh, changes over time but uh, in general why it has not uh, caused a major uh, collapse in whatever market um, i think this also has to do with the U.S. managed to realize a uh, GDP growth, annualized GDP growth uh, for the third quarter of over 5%. So whenever your real GDP growth is higher than your real interest rates, um, then the discussion about debt sustainability is pushed back because whenever you grow faster uh, than you have to pay on your debt, then most of the time people will say, okay, this debt is somehow sustainable. Still, the level, of course, also matters, but that, that is generally the idea and that is the basic sum uh, of the mathematical example that you can use. Now, if we go back uh, to the beginning of this conversation that I expect US GDP growth to fall back to 2% or even below that, if we get a soft slash hard landing, you also see that potential GDP growth in the United States is now well below uh, 2%, so by some it's 1.8, by some others it's 1.6%. If you go to these levels, let's say 1.6%, and um, the current real interest rate is 2% or 1.9%, then I expect people to be even more drawn to this issue of debt sustainability. Eh? So if you add potential GDP growth of, let's say, 1.6%, and then say, okay, now real interest rates are 2%, they're this gap, and that makes it not uh, sustainable. And I think this is going to be the dynamic that more people than now uh, are going to be triggered by this development. And if you then, as the United States, add another budget deficit of 6, 7, 8%, partly caused by these rising interest rates expensive, then I think you will see a massive shift in uh, markets. Uh, and this is also what I'm anticipating uh, when we talk about gold, for example. But people will start to question if even the biggest economy on the planet is not overdoing it. Now, as long as you grow 5%, that question uh, will be pushed back. But I expect it to come back whenever GDP growth declines. 
I definitely want to come back to gold in just a couple of minutes. But before we get there, let's talk about what it means for debt to be unsustainable. Because the first time I heard this argument was in the 1992 presidential campaign when Ross Perot famously said, a national debt of $5 trillion is unsustainable. Well, guess what? We're at $34 trillion. And uh, I don't think it's sustainable either. But clearly, it hasn't brought the system down yet. What would the signs be that, you know, the, the dam is finally starting to break? How would we know that an unsustainable level of debt, which I, I think we agree we, we already have, is actually starting to take the system down? What would that look like? And what would the warning signs be that it's happening? My answer would be twofold. First is, let's take the example of Italy. Of course, we cannot compare Italy to the United States, but there the idea is we are now at a point, even though it's a smaller country, even within the Eurozone, and we look at Germany and France uh, mostly, but you see that without all of these measures, let's not go through all of them, and they already have raised a new one, uh, all of these measures by the ECB, they are targeted to keep debt sustainability for the weakest link. Now, in the United States, uh, that is, of course, a little bit different because they look a little bit better when it comes to potential GDP growth, uh, uh, realized GDP growth, but also as a safe haven asset, uh, uh, U.S. treasuries are still by most investors seen as one of the safest, most liquid assets in the world. But if you look from the great financial crisis and you look at the size of the Federal Reserve balance sheet and you look at the, the number of bonds that have been bought by the Federal Reserve, you already see clear signals that here too debt monetization is needed if you want to uh, continue to accumulate as much debt as the US is doing. Now, the second part is, and that is very much to do with financial markets, we have learned that the combination of structurally low interest rates and especially low real interest rates, as I mentioned, uh, with a little bit more inflation, of course, that inflation should not spike and it should be manageable. It should be possible for the Fed to steer inflation, even though that is very difficult. But if you look at the combination of structurally low yields and perhaps somewhat higher inflation, uh, then you can postpone, kick the can down the road, whatever you want to call it, this debt sustainability issue. So I think that a lot of policymakers, both at central banks and at governments, they do not want to solve it. They want to postpone it. They want to extend it and then leave it for somebody else uh, to do it. And whenever interest rates go down, everybody likes lower interest rates. That is also the public support for that, I think, is much bigger than, for example, austerity. So I think that will be the case for the next five, 10 years. Try to have these two uh, things, uh, low interest rates and higher inflation, and then see uh, uh, what happens with growth and if debt uh, levels come down. And so I think that is the way to go. And that, of course, has major implications for your bond investments in a traditional portfolio, because how much return will they make and how much, uh, how volatile will they become? Now, of course, the conventional wisdom is that if you're concerned about these things, precious metals and gold in particular is the place to invest. We've been in this big, what, what I think is an ascending triangle pattern for a couple of years now, where it seems like about 2085, 2085 on the continuous futures chart is the ceiling on this market. We've had a couple of false breakouts above that, including one big one around December 1st. But it seems like the market just doesn't move above that level and stay above it. Are we about to break? out. Uh, we're certainly close. We're only within about 40 points as we're speaking now. Yeah, I don't know when, when this, is, this is going to happen, eh? but, but I, I look at gold demand uh, trends. Eh? So first of all, we have in the world a couple of, an, a growing number, I should say, of central banks that are um, buying gold like there was no tomorrow. And this includes uh, China. This, of course, has to do with some geopolitical risks that are, are going on and their desire to be less dependent on the US dollar. But I also think, uh, and, and when I talk to investors and when I look at and, uh, how I approach a multi-asset portfolio, you see in general that this whole concept of all of this debt and all of these currencies floating around, should we not have, have at least a, a bit of my portfolio or a bit of that uh, related uh, to something that has a value, uh, to something that has proven a uh, value? And then, of course, the first stop because of his thousands years of history would be uh, gold. Uh, so, so my idea is that gold is gaining popularity because 
debt issues are rising. And as long as you do not break that trend, my idea would be that the demand for gold from investors, from savers, from central banks uh, will continue. Uh, and that means at some point it will break through those ranges that you mentioned. So for the medium term, the longer term, my idea is that gold will rise significantly in price. And once that happens together with lower real interest rates, uh, the correlation be between these two is very negative. Then I think when the Fed starts cutting rates, and investors start to accept that, that there may be more than three or even six, and that also long-term yields are dragged down, uh, that will be my starting point if I have to point one out uh, for another bull run or, or higher prices in uh, gold. But if, they, if that is in two weeks or three months, I don't really care, but I think it will happen. But uh, yeah, so, so that will be my scenario for gold going higher. And Jeroen, let's go a little bit deeper into that. How much higher are we talking about? And tell us a little bit more about your thesis for what drives that. You just said uh, real interest rates, but you also mentioned some of the geopolitical factors. I want to come back to the geopolitics uh, after we cover precious metals. But at what kind of price level are you ultimately targeting for gold? And what is your thesis for why we would get there and what needs to happen economically to get us there? So yeah, price level. Let me let me try to de derive one right here. But in principle, so I look at a value of a gold mostly for its value as an insurance premium against adverse market circumstances. And these are not the same. Some people expect the end of the financial system. Some people expect inflation. Some people are scared of bonds. And if if you look at the gold silver ratio, for example, yeah, so gold uh, is more scarce. Uh, than silver, but its price is much, much higher than you would expect if you look at these two numbers and, and nothing else. Huh? So from there, you can derive some kind of insurance premium, let it be 10 or 11 billion US dollars. Uh, my idea is that that insurance premium over the years will double. Huh? So I don't know how fast that will go. I don't know what, what, what timeline I should have, but my idea is that this whole concept, I want to have something that represents value and also have some history. Uh, and I worry about geopolitical debt and, and inflation, all the things I mentioned before. So my idea is that this insurance premium over the longer term is going to double. And of course, it matters uh, what happens. So if we, uh, what we discussed earlier, if we do get an inflation spike because of uh, a massive Federal Reserve rate cuts, that of course would accelerate this trend uh, of gold. But yeah, my idea is that the insurance premium should at least double over the longer term. And so a longer term is five to 10 years or something, but uh, I have no clear price target for gold apart from I'm pretty certain that it will go up. Jeroen, let's move on to geopolitics because there's a widespread view among analysts and pundits that there's not likely to be a major escalation to a regional conflict in the Middle East. Uh, I can't help but notice it seems like things are kind of heating up with the, uh, the the missile attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. The U.S. and the U.K. Are, are now very actively engaging with the Houthis. And I notice also that it seems like there's a breakdown in agreement between the rest of the EU and and that alliance between the U.S. and the U.K. So it seems like, uh, you know, even the Western forces don't really agree with each other on what the right thing to do is here. Where do you see this all heading and what does it mean for markets? Yeah, it's a very difficult situation always in the Middle East. Um, I think also over the years, because uh, U.S. is now the number one oil producer in the world by far, so the ideas behind the what countries want from intervention, yeah, so you mentioned Europe and within Europe and Europe versus the uh, uh, United States, that's also always a bit yeah, opaque. It is a, bit, a little bit different to what to kind of expect. Uh, what, what I find more interesting is this, that I talk to quite a few people that say it's, it's, it's relatively contained. But if you see... Uh, what it does to populations outside the Middle East uh, and how these populations sometimes are uh, divided extremely about which is the, the bad guy and which is the good guy and, and, and add to that social media. I think that all of these issues, and the Middle East is a very important example, uh, are very much global because in their own populations, this is an issue that is not being resolved. The contrary, eh? people are, are even more polarized by what they see on social media by this. So, so my idea is that the odds that this escalates 
also within populations outside of the Middle East, these should be taken into account. Eh? So I'm, I'm not that a big a fan of geopoliticals when it comes to investing because it's very, very difficult to incorporate it into your market views. Eh? How, how do you do that? How do you value that? Uh, but I'm very aware of the potential, uh, let's say, explosive reaction it can have around the world, even though it's localized in a very contained area. And so that is my general idea. And yeah, how this continues, I don't know. I don't know what, because it looks like a mess and um, it, it has been a mess for decades. And I think it will flare down again at some point, only uh, in a couple of years or months or whatever to add. Huh? So, and the question is, must companies be less worth? Should their value decline uh, over this? And I think that a lot of investors tend to forget pretty quickly so that it has no longer lasting uh, impact unless we get this global um, explosion of worries about these uh, fees. Let's expand the geopolitical conversation beyond the Middle East now and talk about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, it seems like there's one consensus that it's winding down. It's pretty much over. Uh, the, Zelensky will be forced to negotiate with Russia, and this is all going to wind up. But then there's a, another view that says, no, it's anything but over, and it's likely to continue for at least another year. Uh, how do you fall on that divide, and what do you see uh, both for markets and for the outcome of the conflict? Yeah, so for markets, I think... Uh the effects are getting smaller and smaller uh, also because it's, it's, yeah, I think a lot of policymakers outside will see it as a local problem that goes on for longer. Uh, I also read a story about an historian that showed or argued at least that the longer it takes, the more it will feel for the aggressor uh, that it is losing. So I don't know if that is the case, hey, but, but I think for markets, Unfortunately, that is still the case. Unfortunately, it will have less impact. Also, because if you look at the things like sanctions, which totally paid not off, they were poorly implemented, of course. Uh, so yeah, I don't think for fin financial markets, it will matter that much unless there is some escalation of the uh, situations. But I agree with you there. There is a reasonable chance that, and I don't know if that is in three months or 12 months, but at, at some point, uh, they will sit together uh, and then, yeah, some kind of truce. Uh, I don't think they will fully resolve it. Huh? There will always be discussions about certain parts of the country, perhaps. Yeah, and then these people there are stuck with that legacy. And, and that is something that, that take decades uh, before that is. But, but, but for the overall global economy and markets, yeah, unfortunately, the, it, it will have less impact or fortunately if you're an investor. But, but I think, yeah, at some point, we will see less of less uh, of it. And that is already the case, of course. It was uh, front page news every day. And now, yeah, only when there are some major developments, uh, you, you get to read more about that. Uh, so, so my idea is it cools down from an investor perspective. Jeroen, another view that is growing in popularity is that the real geopolitical story is not the conflicts that are already occurring, but rather the growing alliance between China and Russia, where it could be headed in the future, and the potential of the West facing a new Cold War that maybe accelerates into some hot conflicts with a, uh, an alliance or, or an axis of China and Russia becoming uh, partners potentially in warfare. Is that a real concern, and uh, how concerned should we be? about it? Uh, where does Taiwan fit into the story? And where do you think it's all headed? Yeah, so on uh, China, Russia, Taiwan relationships, I think, uh, especially for markets, the trend is clear that all of these countries, China, Russia, but also others, they want to reduce their dependency on the US dollar. And of course, this has to do with uh, geopolitical tensions, also about resource security, about intellectual property. If you look at chip makers, for example, even in the Netherlands, they are banned from exporting to China. Yeah, I think in general, there's a massive race for energy, knowledge, defense, perhaps. And that means that if you want to build your own, let's say, economic block, and I think that is what China wants. And of course, Russia wants to join it. But I think China, of course, is in the lead. They want to have their own global economic uh, uh, block that provides for all of these things. Now, of course, some of this intellectual property is resided in uh, U.S. technology firms. So that immediately raises uh, tensions on uh, exporting or using these uh, technologies. Uh, so that is also why I believe that in the longer term, uh, inflation is also likely to be a little bit high, higher. Because if you 
believe in globalization, and I think that a lot of people do. And you can also yeah, make it pretty clear that if you link all supply chains in the world uh, together effectively, that it should lower prices. Then if you do the reverse, if you went in the other direction, then prices uh, would have to go up. Huh? So, And also they will become more volatile huh? because the odds of uh, supply chain disruptions because of these new um, let's say global forces uh, is also higher. And of course, Europe is an excellent example of that uh, when it comes to energy security. They have really shot themselves in the foot by ending all kinds of resources that were reliable. We don't want them perhaps, but they were reliable without having uh, solid alternatives. Huh? So so I think for investors, this is the, this is the key uh, angle to take. So yes, higher inflation, uh, more volatility, and of course, it could also end up in uh, conflicts, even though I, I'm not an expert, but also I don't, I, I never expect a conflict, which is also not very uh, uh, useful as we have seen, but that is my general idea, different global powers, and it also means different global supply chains. Jeroen, you talked about uh, energy prices in that answer. Let's dive into that in a little bit more depth. I agree with you that there's uh, some really foolish decisions that have been made in Europe. Where do you think this is headed? It seems to me that on one hand, the Biden administration is very strongly incented to do everything it can to avoid higher energy prices through the U.S. election. On the other hand, boy, there's just a lot of things brewing around the world. Where do you think it's all headed and what's your outlook for energy prices? Well, mostly volatility. Huh? So, so it will partly depend on how these geopolitical tensions evolve. If they grow less, then oil prices could come down. If they uh, increase, then it goes up, of course. But I think in the case of the United States, it's actually in a pretty solid um, starting position huh? because they are the larger, largest oil producer in the world, unlike Europe. Huh? So, so. In the end, we all need energy and uh, we can discuss where this energy should come from. Um, but if you don't have it, that is the worst thing you can do as a politician. And that is what is happening in Europe. So, so from that angle, the US is doing much better. And of course, because it's an election year, Biden and his colleagues will try to make that energy part as, as less important as possible. Uh, also because rising energy prices and gasoline prices, they negatively impact consumer confidence. The other thing is um, we should not uh, forget is that, uh, first of all, uh, as we mentioned at the start, I expect global GDP growth and also that of the US to come down. That means less uh, demand for oil, oil, which has been very, very strong. That's the highest uh, ever. Huh? So, so that is a risk on the downside that we have to take into account. And the, the other thing is uh, that could also push oil prices uh, lower is that I would not argue that OPEC is falling apart, eh? but we have seen another member that has decided to leave. And this, of course, is related to the tensions that OPEC is trying to keep oil prices high. And that means they have to cut production every time, while the others that are not in OPEC, they see a very clear opportunity to take market share and produce more. Eh? So I also think that the strength of OPEC uh, could be at debate at some point. And if that translates into overall higher uh, supply, then I think downward pressure on oil prices can become uh, even more significant. Eh? So even though a lot of investors expect oil prices to rise in the longer term for everything that is going on, geopolitical, I can agree. But these two factors could actually mean the opposite, that we see lower oil prices uh, uh, in this year, for example. And that would, of course, benefit Biden if this is one of his uh, elections uh, teams. Jeroen, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, though, please tell our listeners how they can follow your work, what your social media handles are and so forth. You can find me on X or previously known Twitter, uh, JS Blockland. Uh, you can also find my just launched fund at blocklandfund.com. And from there, you will uh, be able to be redirected to everything I write and do on social media. Patrick Serezna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. 
Eric, great interview with your own. Now, joining us again in the postgame segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the postgame chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, that means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to the homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over your own's picture that says, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil. EIA inventory is delayed by the holiday this week, so we don't have it, although there was a surprise build reported by API on Wednesday afternoon. I don't really have much to add this week. So far, oil prices are mostly holding steady, and Wednesday night looks like they're trying to uh, push higher. We'll see if that lasts. But tensions in the Red Sea definitely continue to escalate. So there's always the possibility of a major upside move if something really goes badly wrong. Our friend Dr. Anas Alhaji did an out outstanding Twitter spaces all about the situation with the Houthis in Yemen and how it could escalate and what it means and how it's going to affect shipping and so on and so forth. You'll find a link to that recording in your research roundup email. I continue to believe that most market participants are underestimating how long this Houthi conflict will last or how much shipping is going to be disrupted. But so far, the market effects have been minimal. There's definitely a risk of a major escalation sending oil prices to the moon, but we can assume that the Biden administration is going to do all that it can in an election year in order to prevent that from happening. I'm still holding some of my out-of-the-money calls, though, just in case. Well, Eric, I have a bit of an opinion here on crude because uh, I feel that we've really entered a new phase. We've basically spent several months in a very definitive downtrend. And uh, what we now see is the pattern over the last uh, two, three weeks of uh, accumulation on dips, which is we have these two, three, four dollar drops in crude, and it's almost immediately met with buying that takes it right back into the trade range. And so we really have seen this transition from a distribution cycle with uh, price discovery heading to lower lows to now a trade range, which is very similar to what we saw in the summer of last year. And so really at this stage, what I'm thinking here is is that uh, as this basis, we're going to be looking to see whether or not there's a, a bullish reversal here. Now, before we get too excited about that, it's a reminder that oil spent two months trading in a sideways range before the bull breakout happened last summer. And so just because we're consolidating doesn't mean it's imminent. But but uh, I put on here that 50-day moving average, including uh, the horizontal triangle pattern. And it's a pretty straightforward technical breakout if we uh, get above those levels. So that's uh, certainly what I'm watching here. Now, let's move on to equities. Uh, Nick, I want to get you involved in this conversation. Uh, obviously, it's an OPEX week. Uh, we have the big January roll-off, which many um, individual stock names have a lot of leap options open into it. So there's been a bit of gamma pinning. What's, uh, what's your take and what levels are you watching here? Yeah, Patrick. So the spot price right now on SPX is approximately 4740 We have a call wall above at 4800 and a put wall below at 4700 The expected move for tomorrow's OPEX, which is one of the largest OPEXs we've seen in the last couple of years, is plus minus 40 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 4780 and the lower implied move is 4700 right at that support area and put wall as well. I'm inclined to think we see a larger move perhaps after the OPEX tomorrow uh, into the February OPEX as gamma unpins and we can see perhaps a lot of volatility pick up, possibly going as low as 46.50. But I do think we still see that all-time high hit on SPX prior to that. It's interesting. Uh, Obviously, we're seeing a lot of toppiness in this market, but uh, it seems too easy of a layup to just go short here. Often, the market makes this challenging, and uh, it would not shock me uh, for us to have just one quick break higher that breaks to to a higher high, just guns a bunch of stop losses on short sellers that are sitting right above the previous highs. I generally don't think that there's a big upside to this market. Maybe, you know, uh, a quick 100-point rip on the upside. But generally, it is going to be a part of a bigger topping formation. And I think that by the time we get into February, we could already be mean reverting this uh, 700 point rip that we saw in the prior two months. And so uh, at this stage, uh, I don't see a lot of asymmetry in pressing the long trade beyond a quick swing trade. And uh, I would start to uh, be reducing position sizing in general and or uh, hedging things up along these upper levels. And so, Nick, like on page five, 
five, I, I put on the breath indicator, something we touch on here about once a month that we put it in the chart deck. And this is just looking at the percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving averages, just to kind of get a sense uh, of the breadth within the market. We were, at the end of last year, trading at an 87 level, 87% of stocks above, which is actually the highest reading we saw in three years, just to kind of give an idea of how broad this market rally was and how overbought the conditions were. And while the markets are a stone throw away still from their highs, this is now massively dropped. We have uh, we see this back down to the 60% handle on the downside uh, as the breadth of the market is actually deteriorating under the hood. It st- first started with small cap stocks uh, having that drop and then not recovering. And now we're seeing the equal weight S&P 500 make a bit of a break. So you're starting to see a uh, much broader distribution happening under the hood. And that recent run up that we talked about last week on the NASDAQ, driven by some of these MAG7 stocks, uh, really seems to be keeping the index up at the upper levels. And so it'll be interesting to see whether the breadth continues to deteriorate. Nonetheless, let's actually have a quick peek at that NASDAQ. Uh, what levels are you watching on the queues here? Spot price right now on queues is 407. We have a call wall above at 410 and a put wall below at 400. And the implied move for the January 19th OPEX, which is tomorrow, is plus minus four points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 411 and the lower implied move is 403. We have key resistance above at all time highs and key support below at 400. Now, as you said before, Patrick, the breadth has kind of narrowed and we're seeing the MEG7 drag the market higher, which makes me a bit nervous. I do think that post OPEX tomorrow, we see a decline in broad markets, likely because we see these MEG7 weaken. We've seen, for example, NVIDIA pump over the last couple of weeks by over 10%. That's a massive, massive movement in a company already worth well over a trillion dollars. Um, you know, I'm not saying these companies aren't doing remarkable things, but I think the valuations are running away a fair bit. Additionally, today there was a, an upgrade on Apple and the stock is up currently $4 or so. Um, these divergent views where we're seeing analysts downgrade a stock like Apple a couple of weeks ago and then upgrade it today, for example, tell me that there's a lot of indecision in the markets as to the true value of a given company right now. And these large seven names, you know, we have Meta, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Apple, NVIDIA, and Tesla. These seven names are carrying the markets higher. If any of them weaken, and we're seeing Tesla already weaken a fair bit, we should see the markets fall a fair bit lower. Yeah, those are interesting observations. Like, uh, what is also interesting is the fact that the volatility index finally spiked. I mean, we uh, were stuck down on the twelve handle for weeks, and um, and things were really calm. And suddenly, with just a little bit of selling, uh, we've got a volatility uh, heading up toward the fifteen level. Uh, what's your take on the VIX here? And uh, do you think this is a trend reversal? So right now with the VIX at nearly 15, we should see on average top to bottom movements intraday of about 1%, which we saw yesterday and the day prior. Uh, We're seeing a lot more gapping up and gapping down in uh, SPX right now. And that's telling me that volatility is picking up as we approach this big OPEX, which is tomorrow. Uh, Again, I think that into the February OPEX with earnings coming out and FOMC, we should see a lot more volatility and that should bode for a lower market probably. Right now, I'm not looking at selling premium yet, but premiums are getting kind of juicy intraday. So the zero DTs out of the money spreads are looking pretty nice for me right now. Now on page eight, we have the US dollar index, which has actually made a nice bounce off the bottom right there. What are you guys thinking here? When Jay Powell pivoted dovishly back on December 13th, the first thing I said was that the market will overshoot on discounting dovish expectations, and that's exactly what's happened. But even in the face of Fed Governor Waller jawboning the market expectations to moderate that dovish enthusiasm, I wasn't expecting a full retrace of the post-pivot sell-off in the dollar which has occurred since December 13th. But that's what's happened. It would make sense if the stock market were crashing, but but it isn't. So while I was definitely expecting the dollar's uh, precipitous fall to retrace substantially, I didn't think it was going to be anything close to a full retrace. And I'll be watching it closely to see if that dollar rally continues. 
Eric, you nailed it. It was, uh, to me, the biggest uh, part of this is the fact that we've now fully reversed the um, uh, Powell pivot, which is uh, where that drop uh, meaningfully broke down. What will be really interesting for me is going to be uh, whether that trend continues as we have up to bat uh, a number of major central bank policy statements coming out next week. And if uh, they come out relatively on the dovish uh, side, maybe the dollar strengthens it under, under that environment and begins to strengthen. That would be, to me, technically significant because that's the typical price action that you would see on an intramarket basis when uh, assets are transitioning into a risk-off cycle. And so whether that dollar continues this trend higher uh, into next week is uh, certainly uh, on the high end of my watch list. Now, on page nine, we have the gold futures chart, which is declined off the highs right here. What are your thoughts? The big sell-off this week was a direct result of Fed Governor Waller and other central bankers walking back rate cut expectations. We took out the 55-day moving average as a result of that selling, and the next obvious targets lower if the sell-off continues would be the December 12th low before the pivot announcement at 1988, and then the 100-day moving average at 1981. Patrick, your webinar about how to use collared call options to play the coming bull market that we both expect in gold by the end of the year was extremely well received, and this week's tape action gave you an opportunity to get even better location on that trade. This has become so timely that you're already planning a second webinar for people who missed the first one, so please tell our listeners about that. Yeah, we had a great turnout on Monday uh, for the special webinar, but we've had a number of uh, people reach out to us that missed it and wanted to see the recordings. Well, we are doing it a second time this coming Monday on uh, January 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So those of you that missed it and would like to watch that special webinar, uh, you can register just at bigpicturetrading.com as well. Uh, the link is in the research roundup email. Now, just touching on the gold chart here, Eric, uh, what is interesting is that this is the first time in about uh, three months that we've had a breakdown below the 50-day moving average. But we haven't yet done some significant technical damage. To me, there's significant support here at the round number of 2,000. And uh, and the FIB zones uh, that I'm watching also lie in the 1950 to 2,000 zone. And so you have uh, a little bit of support coming in here. But if we do go through a risk-off cycle in the broader intermarkets, then it's an environment from which gold could have a deeper retracement. To me, all pullbacks on gold are buy on dip opportunities. And this is just a part of the typical uh, cycles and swing tr uh, swings higher and lower. Uh, generally, uh, there is going to be a, a, a very strong move in gold later this year. And the question really is, is that uh, where are the key turn points where the big buying opportunities emerge? Now, on page 10, we have the uranium chart, which we don't cover every week. However, it's had a pretty remarkable run the last couple of weeks. What are you guys thinking here? The breakout in spot uranium prices above $100 a barrel, I think, was a very important psychological signal. That caused a huge gap up in most of the uranium mining stocks. And of course, technical analysis lore says that most gaps get filled. I already have my resting limit orders set up to buy those gap fills of my favorite uranium insider stocks. And I think this market is just getting started. Of course, we could easily get a big correction in the face of broader market weakness, especially if we get that hard landing and recession that everyone's been predicting for three years now. But if that happens, I'll still view it as a blessing and an opportunity to buy more exposure to uranium. Of course, the real story is going to be advanced nuclear technologies. But for now, the only actionable trading strategy that works in public markets is to buy uranium and uranium mining shares. And I think that trade is about to get much more popular than it already is, as more and more retail investors figure out that the only way to get involved in this nuclear renaissance, at least for now, is in uranium and the mining stocks. Yeah, Eric, what a breakout, like uh, a 12% move in one week. Uh, and to me, this happens at a stage where typically if it was just a normal market cycle, it would have already engaged some profit taking. So these characteristics are very much uh, in the nature of bubbles. And so the, the big thing for me to watch here on uranium is have we seen this transition into a bubble phase? And will we see some further parabolic rises in uranium here uh, that 
may have uh, this ripping to 120, 130, or even more on the upside. Um, it's certainly a very exciting move, and uh, uh, it's going to be uh, cer- certainly something that uh, I think we'll have even further follow through here in the weeks to come. Moving on, I want to cover a few more charts. I wanted to start with the natural gas futures. This is the continuous chart. And what we had was a significant breakdown in natural gas prices in the fourth quarter of last year uh, that just uh, saw an extraordinary drop. And uh, just in uh, the recent three, four weeks, we saw a rip to the upside uh, that was uh, uh, quite significant. Just uh, it truly is earning its nickname of the widow maker with this type of volatility. To me, with this pullback that we saw just this week on natural gas, it's going to be uh, really interesting to see whether the buy on dip traders show up here, because uh, it may be a bottom that we've already seen in that gas. And the only way to really uh, uh, solidify that is once we retest some sort of uh, key levels to establish a bottoming or basing formation. So it'll be really interesting to see whether this is the turn point in natural gas. Finally, I wanted to wrap this things up on page 12 with the two tens U.S. Treasury yield curve. And uh, what's interesting is that obviously we were in deep, deep reversion in the summer of last year. And the trend was pronounced down. Uh, we were over 100 basis points in the negative. And then we had a steepening, but it was a bear steepening. That 10-year yield uh, just kept ripping as the 10-year bond uh, kept declining. And so we had actually a steepening in in what was uh, not the traditional bull steepening that a lot of people were expecting. But what's interesting is in the la- since January, at this, so in this month of January, since the start of the, uh, the year, it's actually continued to flatten towards the zero line. But this time, this, uh, the steepening has actually switched to a bull steepener as the two year is actually starting to move. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not we can break out of the 2000 and 22 trade range and really see this steepen above the zero line and uh, what the macro implications of that would be. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, in this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, including the link to the uh, special gold webinar that I'm hosting on Monday, January 22nd uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It also is including a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. 
You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>